Good evening. We're back at Hyde Park this week, and tonight we feature the Madhra District uh, MP for the UPFA, Kanchana Vijay Sekara. Good evening, and a warm welcome to our studios. Good evening, and thank you for having me. Uh, well, I think uh, just to give an introduction of uh, Kanchana Vijay Sekara, SLPP Youth Front <coughs> Committee member and uh, elected to the uh, parliament in 2015 after having uh, been elected to the Southern Provincial Council uh, consecutively 2019 and 2000, uh, 2009 <coughs> and 2014, I beg your pardon. Um, to begin with, I think I'd like to, as the format of this program goes, I'd like to ask you a little about yourself. Did you intend following your father's footsteps when you were studying economics out of the country or when you were doing your A-levels back uh, in Colombo and Kandy? Uh, no, initially my plan was not to enter into politics <coughs> because uh, I've seen my father being a part of a political family as well uh, and being a parliament member for well over two decades. Mm -hmm. uh, what I felt was that it was probably taking his time away from the family time that he had. So my initial reaction to politics was that uh, it's not something that uh, I could see myself in. Uh, yeah, I started off my uh, primary education at Trinity College, Kandy. Uh, my mother was from Kandy. And then I moved to Royal College where I did my uh, O-levels there. Uh, after completing my O-levels, I did my London A-levels at Asian International School. So being through a few schools. Right. And then I did my further studies. Uh, I actually started off in the US, mm -hmm. went there for a year, but I didn't enjoy or I, I didn't feel that was That's the right. That's for your undergraduate studies. Undergraduates, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I didn't feel that was the environment for me to do my studies. Uh, so I decided and I told my parents that I want to move to Australia mm -hmm. because uh, a few friends that were studying with me back then in school were also doing the undergraduates in, uh, in Melbourne Monash University. So I transferred all my credits there and uh, I ended up doing economics and at Monash University in Melbourne. And then uh, the incident that led to me to get into politics was uh, an unfortunate incident, actually. Uh, my father was uh, sidelined from politics from everything in the 2009 uh, March 10th suicide bombing that uh, occurred in Akurasa, Godapitiya. So, that was a turning point in my life, my career choices and everything because I had to give up everything that I was doing in Australia and come back. And from there onwards, uh, in a few months after that, uh, I got the opportunity to uh, contest for the provincial council elections in 2009 and contested again for the 2014 elections. Mm -hmm. So served twice as a provincial council member before being elected into parliament in 2015 started very young. Uh, are you happy with uh, the, the journey you've uh, taken so far? Um, I think so because uh, the choice that I made in getting to provincial councils was actually a better decision that I made uh, which made me understand the Sri Lankan political culture a little bit more even though I have seen political uh, politics within the family in the house uh, my parents doing politics but I never understood uh, or got the experience in doing politics so that made a good platform for me to uh, come into Parliament in the 2015 elections but I was also given the opportunity to run for the pres uh, parliamentary elections in 2010 uh, His Excellency Mahindra Rajapaksa uh, invited me to contest in that elections but I decided that was not the time for me to contest Parliament and be in a Parliament uh, with little experience. Mm -hmm. So I stayed uh, as a provincial council member, uh, recontested, and then got re elected. Right. Uh, got a little bit more experience from the second term. Uh, and after the presidential election in 2015, I think that changed most of our lives. Like people who are working for the SLFP, SLFP members, uh, we didn't have a political party. Uh, or a political leader. So that was a turning point in the politics of Sri Lanka as well. So that gave me the opportunity to contest in the 2015 elections. Uh, and yeah, three years in parliament 
have got a little bit more experience, I think, and I have think with the work that I've done, I can be turned around and look back and think right. that I'm happy with uh, what I've achieved so far. You're also, like I said, the Youth Front uh, Committee member, a committee member in the SLPP, uh, Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna Committee member. Uh, but you also did mention about the leadership of the party from SLFP to SLPP. Uh, how do you feel about this uh, starting at the SLFP and now you have this new party, uh, the Flower Bud Party, very commonly known as the Pohot Tour? Um, actually, I was one of the members, one of the leading members in the SLFP Youth Front as well. Uh, we did a lot of work back in 2009 to 2015 leading up to the elections. You're no longer? No SLFP. longer, no longer. <laughs> We've actually uh, kicked out 2015 straight after the presidential elections. We were called for the first meeting under the leadership of uh, His Excellency Maitri Palasiri Sena. But we had different opinions on our principles and policies and the group that was controlling the party at that time and right now uh, they wanted a, a different they went in a different direction so from day one I was a person who said uh, the two political parties getting together uh, and two parties with two different views two different policies wouldn't do well in the country or within the party as well so that uh, led to a lot of things. Uh, first, I was uh, removed as the SLFP organizer for the Devinur electorate, and I think I was the first organizer who was removed from the position under the leadership of uh, Maitri Palasiri Sena as the party chairman. And that onwards, uh, we were looking for alternatives. We were looking at uh, forming a new party, uh, but that upheld the SLFP policies. So that's when we uh, got together as a group of people in the provincial councils and some people in the parliament uh, proposed the name of uh, His Excellency Mahindra Rajapaksa as the next uh, Prime Minister candidate. So we were hoping to actually contest uh, in the new party in the 2015 elections. But uh, the former president and the, the, the current president, both of them agreed to uh, come into some sort of understanding and contest the elections under the UPFA mm -hmm. in the 2015 elections. But since the election day, I think none of us have worked for the SLFP and we have never given any responsibilities. So that led us to uh, forming the new party that just like you said, the SLPP, Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, uh, which was established uh, sometime last year. And in that, we have been given a role to run the youth affairs in the party and as well as given the responsibility running things in the district as well. Uh, what what uh, role do you play in uplifting youth engagement in uh, the grassroots level of uh, the political <coughs> scenario in Sri Lanka, especially now a budding party uh, which has the blessing of the former president, but yet I think you have ambitions of, uh, of this party playing a greater role uh, in the political spectrum of, of the country. Of course we do. We we hope the, the party will be the, the next governing party of this country. So for that, we are working towards, uh, in different ways, we've been given responsibilities. How practical is, if I may cut in, how practical is that, uh, given the current situation in the, the Constitution, and then there is also uh, the two major parties, the SLFP and the UNP, right throughout we have seen power shifting through these parties, or together, to a coalition of these two parties? It might not look practical in the books because none of us have seen anything in the history or read in history books or anything. Uh, a new political party coming in as a third force taking, the, uh, taking over the governing side. Uh, but what we saw at the last local council elections was a change in the political scenario in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, as a party that was established maybe three months before the elections, uh, the party managed to get uh, close to 48% of the, the national vote and we secured more than 70% of the local council bodies and that, e that was a victory not just for the political party but uh, for the political, uh, I, I, I guess some, some could say that we were going against both the political parties in the government side, governing side and that actually made a stepping stone into the the future election victories as well. So I believe 
uh, with the results that we gained in the last local council elections, when it comes to the next general elections, uh, no matter if the UNP or the SLFP gets together as a coalition or they contest separately or even if they uh, contest in a wider coalition, I still believe uh, the SLPP uh, would have a really good chance at uh, not just winning but uh, making their own government as well making right. our own government. I, I think I, I uh, cut you short during the um, youth engagement uh, yeah. you, were, you were telling us. Uh, the youth engagement, that's a very uh, tricky place to start with, especially the youth movements. Uh, it could go either way in a, in a matter of seconds. So basically, we did a youth program when we were in the governing side in 2014. Uh, that was a Nil Balakaya program uh, that we initiated. But we couldn't actually deliver on the things that we wanted to do in that program because we had an election coming up. Uh, the presidential election came up uh, two years before it was scheduled. And with that, uh, all our plans, all our uh, ambitions, uh, all those things probably changed a little bit. So now what we have done in the last year is to slowly take up on the issue of empowering the youth and understanding what their needs are and focusing uh, for the next 2020, maybe the general elections, and how we go from there, and uh, how we build up our policy, uh, catering to the youth. So we are right now, what we are doing is, we are getting a lot of ideas, we are getting a lot of uh, youth involved in the decision-making process of our next government. So okay. that's what we are trying to do now. We are building our policy statement, we are building our uh, uh, goals for the next uh, next government. Again, back to youth. I think the reason why I also uh, speak a lot about the youth is that uh, uh, youth engagement was a deciding uh, factor in the previous presidential, the good governance government yeah. too. Uh, how aligned do you think are your party's uh, ambitions or vision with the ambitions that you spoke about of the youth? Uh, I think it's very important that youth plays a role in politics, especially in the last presidential election. There is a, there's a saying that uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa lost the presidential election because of minority groups not voting for him. But I, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. I believe the youth probably uh, made a major impact on the election result, especially the people who were voting for the first time uh, in a presidential election, uh, voted for a change because uh, half of their life probably they've seen uh, a SLFP or a UPFA coalition government running the country, and they haven't experienced UNP governments, or they haven't seen the JVP insurgencies, or they haven't seen anything in the history uh, other than UPF or SLFP coalitions. So people wanted a little bit of a change, and there was a lot of things promised to the youth as well. I remember uh, young members of parliament, uh, representing the UNP, Harin Fernando, Sujiva Sena Singer, Dr. Harshal Silva, uh, all of them, uh, they probably spoke to the youth, and they gave a lot of promises to the youth as well. Uh, job security, mm -hmm. uh, technology to the youth, and tax uh, benefits for the youth, all these things were spoke about and uh, that's what changed the youth around. So now I believe it had, uh, it had changed all over again because they couldn't deliver on those promises. And I believe even in the next general election or the next presidential elections, uh, youth will play a major role uh, in deciding who they want to see as the new governing side. And for that, uh, as a party, we, we do actually have about 30 members in our group of 54 who are under 45. And some people are first time parliament members, just like me. And some people are the second time parliament members running from 2010. And their ideas, their policies, uh, their workload will probably uh, give the youth more encouragement that they will probably see uh, their views, their ideas being represented in a government of our own. So uh, we are working on that, and especially uh, His Excellency Mahindra Rajapaksa as the party leader, 
uh, even though he has not been nominated so far, uh, but he is official leader. Uh, he has made sure that even in the local council elections, that the youth was given a chance in running up the elections. So we we actually made it compulsory in most of our local councils to give a chance for youth who's under 35 mm -hmm. to contest and be elected in. Right. So they'll have some experience coming into provincial councils and from there onwards into the parliament as well. Who do you want to see as the, the next uh, candidate for the presidential elections in 2020? Um, I guess that's uh, right now. The people in this country, if you look at the local council elections, uh, they wanted Mahindra Rajapaksa being elected in as the prime minister of this country. So people in this country still see Mahindra Rajapaksa as a capable leader of leading this country. So if he is given opportunity to run, if, he's, if he doesn't have a legal barrier to run, I still feel uh, he has more to offer for this country. Uh, he, has, he could be one of the candidates, but if there's a legal barrier which, does, which makes it impossible for him to run, uh, I guess we have a lot of other names that have been nominated as well. Who would, would, you, who would you want to see I, uh, contesting? I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to comment on that issue because we took a stand in the group meetings as well that we wouldn't uh, discuss this matter out in the public. But when it comes to the elections, we'll probably have a chat about it. There's we'll a question about uh, former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa being a co possible contestant for the 2020 elections. Uh, what is your view? No, there are possibilities. There are several people actually being named as people that could take over as an ex-presidential candidate. Uh, former Defence Secretary, he has proved, he has a proven track record of doing things the right way. And uh, the way, thing he, way he has run as the Defence Secretary, what we saw was uh, a disciplined institute uh, doing things the right way uh, and getting the work done. So that's what a lot of people in this country are looking for. So I feel if he comes out as a presidential candidate, uh, that would be good for the country. There's also a, a certain opinion that uh, President Maitripala Sirisena as the leader of the SLFP, and together with the SLPP, the joint opposition, would there be some sort of uh, agreement in that regard? I, are um, there discussions, or even at the youth level, do you all see any sort of interest? Personally, I don't think there is a chance of that coalition being made because right now uh, yeah there are discussions uh, from Ex His Excellency Maitri Palasiri Sena's side uh, there are discussions there are proposals to make him as the next presidential candidate as well but I don't see that happening because if you look at the entire group that has been there even during the local council elections and three years uh, sitting in the opposition. Uh, they actually uh, didn't want to accept his leadership. So, and the track record that he has in the last three years, I don't think that's something that we can market in this country. And his credibility uh, has been questioned so many times. And we need a leader who takes bold decisions and someone who sticks to the decisions. So I don't see it personally that uh, Maitri Palasari Sena being that candidate from our side. Maybe he could come as a candidate from the UNP uh, SLFP coalition, uh, but not right. from our end. I think we've discussed a wide range of matters concerning politics, youth, and the constitution. I'd like to speak a little about uh, investments, economics, and uh, what the people really feel uh, in Sri Lanka. You've studied economics, so I, I guess uh, this is no new subject to you. But when we talk about foreign direct investments and the expectations of the country, uh, this government has been constantly saying that there is a strong inflow, a constant, uh, continuous inflow of FDI into the country. In, fa in fact, in uh, 2017, last year, we remember the government saying that the largest uh, FDI inflow was registered. Uh, do you feel that there is a coordinated effort in the country to secure these investments going forward? Um, first of all, yeah, this. Uh, FDI is 2017 being the uh, year mark as the year that was the largest amount of money that came into Sri Lanka it was actually questioned in Parliament uh, when it was presented and Honorable Malik Samari Vikrama he presented 
the, the document in Parliament when it was questioned. And what we found out in that was the FDI is actually uh, everything was signed up before 2014. And 90% of that money that came in was for projects like Shangri-La uh, Hotel that is already up and uh, it's running. And the Hambantura Shangri-La uh, Resort. Uh, then you got the Hablock Tower, uh, the second phase and the third phases, John Keel's investments. So all those things were part of the FDIs that they were talking about and the Port City project as well. So uh, if you take out all those things that were signed before the 2014 elections, uh, the actual amount of uh, foreign direct investments that came into Sri Lanka was only about 20 million US dollars. So that has been actually the least amount of money that came in the last 10 years. And, and the other thing is, uh, if you look at all these economic indicators and the central bank reports, uh, they po show a different uh, idea to what the experts say, uh, experts from the government say. Uh, because if you look at the dollar right now, uh, today we stand at 162 and 40 cents. Uh, that's what I heard in the morning. And that had gone from 133 in January of 2015 to 162. So 30 rupees uh, up on the dollar uh, within a within a period of three years. So if the FDIs were coming into the country as the government says, then the dollar would not be going up in any economic indicators. So it would be probably at a stable rate. Uh, and the other thing is uh, about the debt crisis. Uh, the government portrayed a, uh, about this uh, projected uh, and what they said was that Sri Lanka has got into a debt crisis by 2015 and to manage that they need a change of government. But if you look at the real scenario within our debt situation, uh, our total debt was 7,391 uh, billion rupees by January 2015. But by July 2018 it had gone up to 11,400 billion rupees. So it had gone up from 7 trillion to 11 trillion in a space of three and a half years. So our debt crisis has not improved. Uh, it has gone up. Uh, the dollar keeps going up. And our FDIs have kept on going down. There's no investment coming in. Uh, but most of this debt was taken during uh, the uh, previous regime. No, that is also not true. Uh, our complete debt situation in our country, when Mahindra Rajapaksa took over in 2005, was at 2,222 billion rupees. That was the total debt amount. So from 2,222, it went up to 7,391. Uh, you're right, within nine years, it went up by 5,000 rupees, uh, close to about 5,000 mm -hmm. billion rupees. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that 5,000 billion rupees, you saw a port being built in Hambantura, Mattale Airport coming up, uh, three highways, the Colombo Katunayaka Highway, uh, the Matra, uh, Gaul Highway, Gaul Colombo Highway, and uh, development taking place within the country, the Norachore Power Plant, uh, development in the North and East, and as well as uh, fighting a war for uh, three and a half years during that nine year period. So, all that was only 5,000 billion rupees that was taken uh, up to 2015 January. But that had gone up to 11,400 billion rupees. So within a space of three and a half years, this government has managed to take borrow 4,000 billion rupees, whereas the Mahindra Rajapaksa government borrowed 5,000 billion rupees in nine years. They have done it in four and a, three and a half years, uh, borrowing up to 4,000. So whatever indicators that you look at, even if you look at the Fitch ratings, if you look at the Bloomberg ratings, if you look at the Moody's ratings, all these things, they have put Sri Lanka down, graded them on the credit ratings as well. And if you look at the economic indicators in the central bank reports, uh, it gives a clear picture where we were in 2015 and where we are in 2018. Uh, the, the development rate, the economic development rate had gone down from 7.4 to 3.3 by 2017. Uh, our agriculture industry had actually gone into a minus figure. It had gone to from 4.2% to minus 3.4. Uh, dollar had 
gone down, gone up to uh, by 30, 31 rupees, and our debt has increased by 54 percent uh, from 2015 to 2018 uh, July. But all this, I think, the the government uh, their, their argument is that most of these uh, indicators are during a period uh, within which uh, the country itself faced severe. Uh, disasters, natural disasters, the droughts, agricultural situation, floods, and also an incremental increase of uh, the debt servicing, uh, outstanding debt servicing due to rupee depreciation. That is again not a true statement. In one way, yeah, we had to face through droughts and floods as well. But if you look at the nine-year period where Mahindra Rajapaksa was running this country, for four and a half years, there was a war that has we, uh, we had to fight a war that was taking more than the drought and the, the floods combined together. And the other uh, task that we had to do during that garment was to the oil prices, the world oil prices were heavily going up and we had to manage that as well. But this garment in the first two and a half years, uh, with the oil prices going down from 2014 November onwards to 2018 January, uh, they made a saving of about six billion dollars on uh, oil imports so so the government had a drought and a flood to fight with but they also had the uh, recoveries from the oil prices as well as uh, not running a war uh, they had all those expenses and and as well as if you see the the income tax uh, gathered from people had increased by uh, 2014 uh, which was at about uh, I cannot remember exactly the amounts, but it had doubled from 2014 to 2018, the projected uh, income from uh, taxes. Mm -hmm. So uh, this government uh, has probably mismanaged everything, and probably the bond scam has to do with most of the economic impact that they are receiving right now, not the debt crisis Mahindra Rajapaksa left with them, uh, because the bond issues in February of 2015 and March of 2017, uh, that created shock waves in the economic sector in the whole country. Uh, it, the, uh, the interest rates went up by 2% overnight in February of 2015. So that impacted everything. And dollar keeps going up, that impacts the, the borrowings as well, the money that we had to pay back in dollars. Uh, and about debt servicing loans, Hambantara port is what they're saying that was a massive burden to the Sri Lankan economy. But uh, during Mahindra Rajapaksa's government, uh, we did borrow uh, 1,200 million mm -hmm. uh, US dollars from the Chinese Exim Bank. But the loan was paid back, 491 million dollars was paid back by 2015 January. Mm -hmm. So we had only uh, another 900 million to pay back uh, till 2033 and loans that were uh, obtained during the UNP governments for Mahabali project, maybe the Colombo Harbour projects, they are still going on. So those were also serviced during the Mahindra Rajapaksa nine year period. So any government who comes into power uh, has that burden of uh, debt that's been borrowed by the other government. So they had to carry that forward. But what we see is the economic uh, collapsing as we see it right now is due to the fact of the, the bond issue is bond issues taking place and the mismanagement of funds in the last three and a half years. Right. Uh, why are you so against the, uh, the Singapore FTA? Uh, you've been quite vociferous about it and uh, <coughs> even after a monitoring um, committee was set up to evaluate it, you still say that, uh, uh, well, you, you just brush off uh, its impact. Uh, the Singapore trade agreement, first of all, it was not done in the correct procedures. Uh, uh, a trade agreement should be something uh, that should be uh, not just from our side. Members on the government side have said it in Parliament last week as well. I saw Minister Arjun Ranatunga, uh, Ratanathero, uh, and a few other ministers who were part of this government, uh, stating that they have never seen the Singapore uh, agreement. So first thing, the cabinet has to approve it. Mm -hmm. Then the parliament has to see the agreement, then the parliament approves it. That's how a trade agreement comes into effect. But this particular trade agreement 
when it was presented in the cabinet, uh, the cabinet ministers made a note to the cabinet saying it has to be studied more and it has to be referred to the AG for further uh, analysis on it. So a 1,730 page document is not something that you can study overnight. So by the time the AG's advice came into effect, the documents all, document is already signed before it go into the cabinet for the second time. So that's why we say it was done not in the correct procedures. And if you look into the details of the Singapore Trade Agreement, uh, you just have to look at the Singapore Trade Ministry website, mm -hmm. which says clearly that getting into agreement with Sri Lanka, doing the Singapore Sri Lanka Free Trade Agreement, saves at least 10 million US dollars to the Singapore government on the first year itself. So there is a 10 million uh, loss in starting the procedure as well. And it says this is the most liberal uh, agreement that they have entered within a country. Uh, there are a few things that uh, we can point out clearly because Singapore is anyway a free trade country. Only a few products are taxed in Singapore and anyone can uh, bring their stuff into Singapore which is tax free. So we had that tax benefit anyway. But mm -hmm. products that are coming from Singapore, uh, that was taxed. So now we have given a tax benefit for them rather than receiving uh, anything for our end. Uh, we were anyway receiving that. So we have given that tax benefit to Singapore as well. And the major, I'm just going to point out one mm -hmm. thing that is very important in it is it says that it's a most liberal agreement that they have entered into because they say rule of origin is not uh, been recognized in this agreement. Uh, a rule of origin is, okay, you manufacture something in a country, you have to say, uh, for example, if you say it's something pro uh, produced in India, uh, rule of origin, it will say made in India. So you can export that to uh, Singapore, mm -hmm. but when it's re-exported from Singapore after value addition or without any addition, it has to say made in India. Mm -hmm. But rather than that, now then they can change it to, because a rule of origin is not considered, they can say it's coming from Singapore. So every product that comes into Singapore from all, all these other countries, with this trade agreement, has the opportunity of coming to Sri Lanka without any taxes being paid for. So mm. that's why we are saying this is not an agreement so that we which can... Which means Singapore could be a hub for other countries to, uh, through which uh, exports could be directed, directed to Sri Lanka. Directed to. Even, even, even some of the stuff that we have prohibited from free trade agreements uh, with Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, from with uh, India, with Bangladesh, those products could still go to Singapore and it could well say it's made in Singapore and come back to Sri Lanka. Right. So that is, that is a major concern. Uh, and it has allowed uh, all these other businesses uh, to come into Sri Lanka as well. And mm, uh, technically, there are issues. Uh, and the legal impact, there are some issues because none of these things can be uh, challenged in a court in Sri Lanka. Okay. It has to go into arbitration court. And I don't think a country like us can fight cases in arbitration courts. And we've seen uh, precedents before, even Australian government uh, had this issue with the tobacco company. Uh, it went into arbitration court and finally the Australian government had to let go of it. Uh, they had to pay massive taxes, massive amounts of money f as legal fees mm -hmm. and fines as well. So we are still hopeful because it has been challenged in the Supreme Court. Right. Uh, there are seven cases pending mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just, we just came from the morning from a meeting uh, in the morning uh, we had a meeting with uh, 48 professional groups. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not affiliated to any political party. Uh, the GMO is one uh, group, uh, the IT sector, uh, the industrial sector, the architects, uh, the banking sector, all of them got into one platform today. Uh, and political party representatives of the JVP, the JO, uh, and some uh, United National Party members who are against this uh, mm -hmm 
agreement as well was so, in the same platform. Uh, your, your protests and your opposition to this agreement will be voiced at uh, on the 5th, I think, here, uh, the, the, the Jana Bala Mehuma. Uh, yeah, Jana Balaya. Jana Balaya, Jana Balaya yeah, yes. Jana Balaya Kolongata. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, before we wrap up, we'll talk a little about that. I mean, is it is it about protests uh, as the opposition that you should be engaged in? Uh, you're bringing in a large crowd, I think. That's the plan. But what more should we expect from the opposition going forward? Um, this is a way that we can uh, actually this is a platform where everyone who has been let down by this government, let down by their promises, let down with their economic plan, let down by all the policy decisions that they have made in the last three and a half years, this is a platform for all those people to come out and uh, show their protest to the government. So that is what we are building on the 5th of September in Colombo. Uh, the JO and the SLPP is just doing the organizing work but this is not affiliated to any political party. Mm -hmm. So we have invited uh, political party activists from this is the from JLP. The Sorry? The, the youth wing is youth organizing. Wing. Youth wing is organizing this. And uh, we have invited people who have voted for the JEP, people who had voted for the UPFA, mm -hmm. people who had voted for the UNP, uh, people who had voted against us, all of them, but who had been led down by the by this government to come out and voice their concerns because there are things that are happening within the parliament that is undemocratic. Uh, we don't see elections being held on the right time. We see Singapore trade uh, agreement and agreements uh, relating to trade that are being signed without the consent of the parliament or the cabinet. Uh, and we see a lot of uh, uh, the economic collapsing. So to voice their concerns, this is a platform that the, the JO uh, with the SLF, SLPP, Sri Lanka Pujana Peramana Youth Front, is uh, making for the general public to come out and voice their concerns because we feel the government doesn't really want to hear anything within the parliament because we have a group of 69, peop 69 this people. Was the same, this was the same accusation to the Mahinda Rajapaksa government back then from the opposition. Um, the back then, the opposition, I think, protested uh, just to get not to get an election. They protested there were way too many elections at that time. They protested on certain issues. Yeah, we, we, we also feel like even in our previous government, there were things that led to the down, downfall of our government. Probably places where we should have listened a little bit more, uh, looked at uh, in a different way. Uh, so I think we have addressed those concerns, uh, addressed those issues. Uh, that's why we feel we are ready to uh, take the governing side again in this country uh, to deliver the goods. But this platform, of course, uh, is not a politically affiliated platform. Uh, the JVP is coming in, mm -hmm. uh, they're activists, uh, the trade unions are coming in, professional groups are uh, joined with us, and a lot of private sector companies, they are uh, entrepreneurs, uh, people working for private sectors, and all of them had uh, already pledged their support to uh, protest on these things. So this is going to be uh, one of the biggest protests that we've probably seen in Sri Lanka. So uh, that's why we asked the public who had been led down by this government to join us on the 5th of uh, September to Colombo. Uh, a lot of people will be uh, uh, probably feel inconvenienced by the uh, by the protest, but we request you to uh, join with us and show the protest to the government. Right, I think on that note, it's time we wrap up Hyde Park for tonight. Thank you very much, Kanchana, for your time uh, here in our studios. We had with us Mathura District Parliamentarian uh, representing the United People's Freedom Alliance joining us here at Hyde Park tonight. Thank you very much. We'll see you again next Thursday at the same time.